So yeah, it's so great to welcome you all uh, for a very exciting ABM talk. For those of you who are new to us, uh, these talks are part of our um, German Research Foundation funded project that is called Seeing Antisemitism Through Law, High Promises or Inter uh, Indeterminacies. Our ABM talks are named after the late Avram Bar Menachem, who received his legal doctorate from the University of Gießen before fleeing the Nazis to Palestine, where he later became the mayor of the city of Netanya in Israel. It is during these talks that take place on the last Thursday of every month at 4 p.m. Central European time that specialists from all walks of life are invited to speak about anything related to law, anti-Semitism, and seeing, which obviously stands for all our senses. The guidelines are very simple and open, so we ask our speakers to talk for about 25 minutes, that today, for Diane's sake, mm -hmm. might, you know, leap into being 35 minutes, <laughs> and then invite the commentator uh, to add their comments in approximately 15 minutes. It is then that we open the floor that is still virtual to our audience uh, for questions. We record the first part and keep uh, the second Q&A part uh, for a more discreet debate and uh, questions from the audiences. So it is my great pleasure and honor to get back to our ABM talks from a long summer break. And I am doing that from Queens College in Cambridge where I spent some of the term as a Schwedler Fellow. Significantly today is exactly the middle of Aseret Yamei Tshuva, so the 10 days of repentance for us Jews. It is the period between Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, which to us is known as uh, Ayamim Anoraim as well. And according to traditional Jewish teaching, God opens the book of life each year on Rosh Hashanah to inscribe a person's fate for the coming year, um, but does not seal our fate until Yom Kippur, which is the day of atonement, and it's uh, on Wednesday, the 5th of October. So the days of repentance are offering us Jews or everybody who is willing to participate in this tradition, the opportunity to atone for past misdeeds, seek forgiveness, and mend our behavior through the practice of tshuva, their return. Prayers on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur as well are um, intervention period. And it's um, uh, often taken in the form of recognizing and confessing past deeds. So five days to go. And uh, keeping this in mind that our talk today deals with critical race theory, it's, it's more suitable than I first anticipated because there's so many links uh, that link race to repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation, that it's, re it's really, really great to have you, Diane, here. Um, uh, so Diane uh, Kem Kemkel is a visiting professor at the Law um, at South Southern University Law Center at Baton Rouge, Louisiana. And you will talk to us today about critical race theory. Um, it is not anti-Semitic, so why do some people say that it is? Prior to joining, oops, sorry, that's better. Me. I don't know how to. <laughs> it's because of the connection between the computer and the phones. Uh, so I'm sorry about that because um, it's on silent, but it's not uh, silent on my computer. All right, so uh, yeah, Diane, prior <laughs> to your joining the Southern University Law Center, you taught uh, ABA accredited law schools in California, Florida, in New York, and Texas. Uh, Professor Kemke graduated magna cum laude from the Harvard College and was a Malone Fellow in the Humanities at the University of California, Berkeley prior to attending law school. She was awarded an LLM uh, on taxation, no less, uh, with a summa cum laude, also from the University of San Francisco. And uh, her work has frequently been cited by state and federal appellants, courts, and in leading practice journals. Our commentator is joining us from New York, so a little bit later than uh, the West Coast, uh, is Professor Tiffany Graham. Uh, Associate Dean for Diversity and Inclusion and Associate Professor of Law at the Tour University in New York. Uh, Professor Graham graduated mag magna cum laude from Harvard and Radcliffe Colleges. She attended Virginia Law School um, where she earned her JD. She previously clerked for the Honorable Richard Roberts on the United States District Court for District, the District of Columbia. Professor Graham um, joined the faculty of Toro Law Center at 
at Long Island in New York in May 2020. So basically in the midst of Corona, after serving for six years on the faculty and as the Associate Dean of Academic Affairs at the University of South Dakota School of Law, Professor Graham primarily teaches in the areas of constitutional law and race and law, but has also taught criminal procedure, law and sexuality and torts. In addition to her scholarly work, Professor Graham is active uh, in the professional community where she recently served as the chair of the South Dakota State Advisory Committee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights and has now been appointed to the corresponding New York State Advisory uh, Committee. So without further ado, I thank you very much for joining us today and I really look forward to our conversation. So Diane, the floor is yours. All right, let's get started. So this, uh, what I'm going to be speaking to you about is a small piece of a considerably larger project. So some of what I'm going to say will be unfortunately very concise, but I hope we have a chance to expand on it. And I will do my best not to go too much over time without also uh, racing too quickly through what I'm going to say. So without further ado. There is legitimate frustration in some quarters of the Jewish community that critical race theory either overlooks Jews entirely or wrongly treats Jews as white people simpliciter. But there is also a strain of less justified and mostly unspoken offense at being unfairly perceived as no different from other white Americans, politically, historically, or otherwise. If critical race theory is not anti-Semitic, and yet this accusation is sometimes made by thoughtful people apparently in good faith, that calls for an explanation. I believe the most fruitful, although potentially unsettling way to understand it, employs the moves to innocence model pioneered by Tuck and Yang in the context of indigenous decolonization theory. This approach helps us to see the allegation as an attempt first to render American Jews blameless for racial inequality and structural anti-Black racism in America. Second, to foreground the Jewish experience of discrimination and exclusion and de-emphasize Jewish benefit from white supremacy and white privilege. And third, to erase from view patterns of Jewish complicity with anti-Black racism or incidents of Jewish anti-Black racism itself. By complicity, I mean to include the ways in which generations of Jewish immigrants and their descendants benefited from the relative Jewish proximity to whiteness in America. These moves are then fitted together into a coherent narrative of the Jewish experience in which any support or advocacy by Jews for black civil rights appears as a form of supererogatory political virtue, not recompense for unearned benefit or a demand of justice, but a gift freely given and thus a demonstration of the moral superiority of Jews to their white Christian fellow citizens. It is not simply that critical race theory is not anti-Semitic. In my view, critical race theory contains the most useful intellectual tools currently available for coming to a proper understanding of both racism and anti-Semitism because it offers the richest and most promising account of the operations of white Christian nationalism and white supremacy, at least in the US context. By rebutting the allegation that CRT is anti-Semitic and exposing and dismantling the moves to innocence that seek to deny Jewish complicity and benefit from white supremacy, I hope to rehabilitate critical race theory, which I'll sometimes refer to as CRT, to more effectively combat anti-Semitism. So the first step in rebutting the charge against CRT requires us to distinguish it from other things that it's often combined with by those who are carelessly making this accusation. The first of these is Black Lives Matter, more correctly called the Movement for Black Lives, which is primarily a political activist movement outside the academy. Ethnic studies which is an umbrella name for a cluster of academic disciplines, often including Black or African American studies, Asian American studies, Indigenous or Native American studies, and Hispanic or Latinx studies. And finally, from diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, sometimes used using the acronym DEI, 
which are generally centered on non-discriminatory employment practices in the workplace, including the university as a workplace. Occasional or even more pervasive concerns about anti-Semitism among any of these, however legitimate, are only tangentially related to anything originating in critical race theory. Similarly, the charge of anti-Semitism also sometimes rests on a highly tendentious reflexive conflation of all criticism of Israel, often misleadingly labeled anti-Zionism, with anti-Semitism. Each element of this equation, that CRT equals anti-Zionism equals anti-Semitism, is at best problematic and always sloppy, but so too is the facile analogy that mischaracterizes Israel as a settler colonial state as if the relationship between Israel and the Palestinians on the one hand could be readily analogized to that between the US government or American white people or the early US colonists and black people and indigenous people on the other. Both sides in this debate are often guilty of the same ignorance, oversimplification, and lack of genuine concern for human beings of which they accuse those on the other side. For our purposes here, while there may be anti-Zionism, including some anti-Semitic anti-Zionism, to be found in Black Lives Matter, ethnic studies, and DEI efforts, it too is not appropriately attributed to critical race theory. So what is critical race theory? Critical race theory is first and foremost a legal historical theory about the development of American law and its apparent impotence to meaningfully change the material conditions of life for most Black people and people of African descent in the United States. It is critical in the Marxist sense, not in the colloquial sense. Its intellectual antecedents include critical legal studies, a recovery of legal realist work from the early 20th century with a strong Marxist element that was reinvigorated in the 1970s. As a critical discipline, critical real race theory views liberal legalism and formalism with skepticism and even derision. At the same time, as a theory advocating racial equality in the United States, which is a constitutional regime with a very elaborate system of law, Critical race theory recognizes the importance of law in both perpetuating and combating inequality and racism, specifically racial inequality, and most specifically, the inequality of the formerly enslaved and their descendants. It grapples with the centrality of law and legal institutions in the history of enslavement, the significance of the post-Civil War amendments to the U.S. Constitution, intended to establish at least the formal legal equality of the formerly enslaved, and the entire system of public and private law and legal institutions as they shape the life chances of individuals and groups in the United States in race-specific ways down to today. Practitioners of critical race theory are as likely to be found criticizing the received pieties of post-civil rights movement America as they are to be advancing familiar claims. For example, Derek Bell, the first black law professor at the Harvard Law School and an early practitioner of CRT or proto-CRT, was perhaps among the first prominent civil rights lawyers and legal academics in the United States to publicly criticize Brown against the Board of Education, the unanimous 1954 Supreme Court decision holding that segregated primary schools were unconstitutional or to call for its critical reevaluation in light of its practical inefficacy. As one put it, one CRT scholar put it, the key insight of scholars associated with critical race theory is that the formal equality enshrined in civil rights legislation was not sufficient to repair the damage of slavery and Jim Crow, that the legacy of racial domination remains embedded in law, custom, geography, and political economy. Critical race theory thus set out, quote, to understand how a regime of white supremacy and its subordination of people of color have been created and maintained in America, and in particular to examine the relationship between that social structure and professed ideals such as the rule of law and equal protection. 
CRT wrestles with the fundamental paradox of race, that race is a social construction denying its biological or scientific reality and affirming that there is no legitimate scientific or biological distinction between races, while recognizing the legal, social, political, and other ways in which race is and has been reified, especially in law, and is thus very real. Critical race theory was motivated at its inception by deep dissatisfaction with traditional civil rights discourse. This is not to be understood as either a criticism of the civil rights movement or an attempt to diminish its significance. But they remind us that the fact that civil rights advocates met with some success in the nation's courts and legislatures ought not to obscure the central role the American legal order played in the de-radicalization of racial liberation movements. On their view, racial justice was embraced in the American mainstream in terms that excluded radical or fundamental challenges to status quo institutional practices in American society. So that the suppression of explicit white racism, the widely celebrated aim of civil rights reform, came in the form of a dominant legal conception of racism as a discrete and identifiable act of prejudice based on skin color. In this way, the deeply transformative potential excuse me, potential of the civil rights movement's interrogation of racial power was unfortunately lost. Critical race theory is a critic of liberal legalism, an approach which aims at the establishment of formal rights through changes in law, cases, and legislation, and seeks to eliminate from legal consideration those individual traits deemed irrelevant to one's legal rights. CRT also criticizes so-called colorblind constitutionalism, the idea that the U.S. Constitution and the rights guaranteed by it can and should be understood and interpreted without any explicit reference to race, and that progress consists of purging the presence of race from American law. By contrast, CRT is explicitly and intentionally race conscious and is often critical of these other approaches including those taken by advocates and judges in leading landmark civil rights cases. CRT sees itself as a left-wing intervention into race discourse and a race intervention into left discourse, an intellectually distinctive critical account of race on terms set forth by race-conscious scholars of color. What critical race theory offers in place of an individualized and granular notion of racism is a much broader and deeper concept, structural, sometimes called systemic racism, which refers to the entire set of laws and legal institutions that created, codified, and continue to perpetuate racial inequality across a wide variety of spheres of social life. Structural racism refers to the totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through mutually reinforcing systems of housing, education, employment, earnings, benefits, credit, media, healthcare, and criminal justice. These patterns and practices in turn reinforce discriminatory beliefs, values, and distribution of resources. The close analysis of these social facts gives meaning to the idea in CRT that racism is not a rare and isolated event, but a deep feature of institutions. And in that sense, normal, rather than deviant. The current critique of CRT, uh, promulgated by the Trump administration, but with lasting effects in the US, that it is anti-white and current legislative attempts to ban the teaching of CRT on the basis that it teaches divisive concepts about inherent racial characteristics, or that it teaches that members of any race are inherently racist or inherently inclined to oppress others, thus gets things exactly wrong. Critical race theory focuses on structures, not individuals, and its anti-essentialism about race means that it categorically denies that individuals identifying as or assigned to any race have any inherent traits at all, good or bad. The way in which critical race theory calls for an anti-racist race-conscious approach 
is a nuanced theoretical position that has proved to be demonstrably nearly unintelligible in mainstream political discourse. In any event, the connection between all of this and Jews and anti-Semitism is far from obvious. So we must ask a basic question. Why would people accuse a theory of being anti-Semitic when that theory is not really about Jews at all? The short answer is through the identification of Jews as white people. In April 1967, when his literary career was already well established, Black American author James Baldwin published an anguished penetrating essay in the Sunday New York Times Magazine entitled, Negroes are anti-Semitic because they're anti-white. With Baldwin's characteristic yet inimitable force and style, he conveyed the idea that in America, by which he really meant in the New York City and especially the Harlem of his youth and young manhood, Jews were white men from the point of view of black ghetto dwellers. He is almost deliberately careless in describing the place of Jews in the white power structure that oppressed Harlem and the black people in it. The landlord, grocer, butcher, clothier, and pawnbroker were Jewish, as he recalls. Quote, the merchants along 125th Street were Jewish. At least many of them were. I don't know if Grants or Woolworths are Jewish names. As for the welfare workers, the police, and the teachers, quote, not all of them were Jewish. Some of them, alas, were Black. The same goes for the thieves in his father's union. By the time Baldwin gets to his adult experience with the army, the post office, a store called Wanamaker's, Nabisco, as to whether they are Jewish, he says, I don't know and I don't care. In reflecting on his experience, he expressly rejected familiar anti-Semitic tropes and conspiracies of Jewish control. Baldwin knew full well that it is not the Jew who controls the American drama, it is the Christian. He did not use the phrase white privilege, but that is what he was talking about when he said, the Jew is a white man, and when white men rise up against oppression, they are heroes. When black men rise, they have re reverted to their native savagery. In the American context, the most ironical thing about Negro anti-Semitism is that the Negro was really condemning the Jew for having become an American white man, for having become, in effect, a Christian. The Jew, quote, is singled out by Negroes not because he acts differently from other white men, but because he doesn't. If one blames the Jew for having become a white American, one may perfectly well, if one is Black, be speaking out of nothing more than envy. It is important and indeed essential, I believe, to understand and appreciate that two things can simultaneously be true. That James Baldwin really did come of age in a New York City where Jewish proximity to, access to, and assimilation into whiteness excited Black rage. And at the very same time, the Jews of New York City and elsewhere experience social and legal discrimination and exclusion in America after a millennium of anti-Semitism in Europe culminating in genocide, and that Jews saw themselves as mostly on the right side of racial issues in the US. Baldwin correctly saw that it is the history of Christendom which has so successfully victimized both Negroes and Jews. Jointly victimized, perhaps, but if we fast forward from the tumultuous 1960s to today and compare the respective situations of these communities, the disparities are even starker. While American Jews are markedly better off in terms of education, income, wealth, and health than the American population overall, with respect to these measures and other indicia of equality, security, and prosperity, the Black community lags considerably behind. The data about income, wealth, life expectancy, incarceration, and so on abundantly bear this out. In decolonization is not a metaphor. Their groundbreaking and still profoundly relevant 2012 work in anti-racist indigenous theory, Eve Tuck and Kay Wayne Yang identified and described six phenomena they called settler moves to innocence. For our purposes, the specific details of these moves, most of which are quite specific to the indigenous experience and to the immediate post-occupy period in which they were writing, 
matter less than their rhetorical, political, and psychological function. Tuck and Yang built on work by Janet Mawinney to understand how white settlers and their descendants in the U.S. think about their relationship to indigenous people. Mawinney originally defined moves to innocence as strategies to remove involvement in and culpability for systems of domination. Tuck and Yang expanded this idea. Settler moves to innocence are those strategies or positionings that attempt to relieve the settler of feelings of guilt or responsibility without giving up land or power or privilege, without having to change much at all. Each move is, quote, one way the settler, disturbed by her own settler status, tries to escape or contain the unbearable searchlight of complicity of having harmed others just by being oneself. These moves, quote, get in the way of more meaningful potential alliances. They problematically attempt to reconcile settler guilt and complicity and rescue settler futurity. It's important to keep in mind that a statement functioning as a move to innocence is not best analyzed for its straightforward truth value alone. Consider Tuck and Yang's first settler move to innocence, which they call settler nativism, in which, quote, settlers locate or invent a long lost ancestor who is rumored to have had Indian blood. And they use this claim to mark themselves as blameless in the attempted eradications of indigenous peoples. What is most significant about this claim is not whether the person in fact had an indigenous ancestor, Hence, Tuck and, Yu, and Yang use the surprising phrase, locate or invent. Instead, the point is to understand how that claim functions in relation to claims by and about harms to indigenous communities and the moral or political demands those harms place on each person. As Tuck and Yang understand it, those demands are largely independent of whether the person in fact had indigenous ancestry. The value of the analysis is to see how the claim of settler nativism is operating, rhetorically, politically, psychologically, even epistemologically. So now finally, we are ready to apply this moves to innocence approach to the situation of Jewish immigrant descendants vis-a-vis -vis American black people, and more specifically to the responses of the American Jewish community and its members to the condemnation of white supremacy found in critical race theory and the implicit or explicit inclusion of Jews among its perpetrators or beneficiaries. I adapt these tools with great caution and fully aware of important disanalogies between the situations, which I'm not going to enumerate here, although they are identified in the paper. Like the moves identified by Tuck and Yang, some of these may cause discomfort may embarrass you or make you feel implicated. I know they did for me. I've identified five moves to innocence of most relevance here. So I'm gonna name them and then talk a little bit about them and that'll do it. The first is spatio-temporal distancing. This move to innocence involves distancing not only oneself, but one's ancestors from the wrongs of slavery. Like many Jews descended from 20th century Ashkenazic immigrants, when the topic is slavery in America and its long-term consequences, I have often thought or even felt compelled to mention that no one from whom I am descended was even in the United States at the time. Even now, I cannot deny the psychological attraction of this move to innocence. The more I understand structural racism in the United States, the stronger is my desire to distance myself from it. But this type of absolution by ancestry is a moral non sequitur. Wrongful acts by my ancestors would not convict me now. And thus their failure to have committed any such acts because they were in Europe at the time does not exonerate me because my responsibility is not based on individual acts. This move is in effect a denial of the existence of structural racism and white privilege from which I have enjoyed unearned benefit. By ignoring these larger structures, this individualized schema also conceals them. The second of the moves to innocence I call comparative subordination. 
It's related and suggested by the third settler move to, to in a sense, in Tuck and Yang, which they call colonial equivocation. And in that setting, it is the claim, we are all colonized. As they explain, it may be a true statement, but it is deceptively embracive and vague, especially in its inference, none of us are settlers. In the context of Jewish immigrant descendants, this move is the claim that we are all discriminated against or hated, or perhaps we were all discriminated against or hated. Its inference that Jews have never discriminated but only been discriminated against functions much like colonial equivocation. When Jews tell stories of discrimination, of exclusion, of second-class status, they tend to look in only one direction, upward at dominant white Christian, often Protestant society. At its best, asserting the history of anti-Semitism is not or need not be a move to innocence at all. It can be an embrace of CRT and its methods for their promise in theorizing this aspect of Jewishness in America and American law. It may begin as a critique of any version of critical race theory that does not also theorize anti-Semitism. Jews too have been subordinated by American law. And one could continue that sentence by saying, and therefore critical race theory can also be used to theorize anti-Semitism and Jewish subordination. It might also be asserted as a more serious criticism of CRT, not as a move to innocence, but as a negative evaluation of the satisfactoriness of a theory of legal discrimination and subordination that fails to account for an important example of it, anti-Semitism. This, however, has the danger of becoming an allegation of what I call anti-Semitism by omission, and sometimes slightly jokingly, although I know it's a del delicate subject for joking, you're so vain, or perhaps we're so vain. Omission is not exclusion. Even being marginalized to some degree is not the same as anti-Semitism. Jews may be at the center of our own story, but that does not mean we must be at the center of every story. On a critical race theory analysis of American racial hierarchy, what is legally significant about Jews is that they are not black. This is not the same as the assertion that Jews are white, any more than it is an assertion that members of the Cheyenne tribe or Chinese immigrants are white. The third of the moves to innocence I call historic allyship. This move consists of reciting the history of Jewish opposition to Jim Crow segregation in the American South, assistance to black people victimized by it, and support for black civil rights and the civil rights movement, especially as exemplified by the conduct of extraordinary individuals. The key components of this narrative nearly universally familiar to American Jews born in the past hundred years, are tales of individual heroism, moral virtue, and selfless dedication to justice and to kun olam. Each of the people who figure in these stories is a real life person of whom American Jews can rightfully be proud. Each is deeply worthy of our study, admiration, and perhaps our emulation. But this form of storytelling becomes problematic when any story that does not conform is suppressed, and when these flattering stories are then treated as paradigmatic, with the further implication of the moral or political superiority of Jews to other white people at the time. While the broader Jewish community can deservedly pride itself on some aspects of the Jewish role in civil rights history, too often it is a story of how American Jews having assimilated relatively successfully into America's white power structure, saw black communities as in need of their help, a call which frequently resonated for Jews based on a Jewish history of persecution that tended to take little or no account of any contribution to, complicity with, or benefit from ongoing white supremacy in the United States. Put another way, Jews frequently and admirably saw themselves as part of the solution to race prejudice in the United States, but rarely as part of the problem. The fourth move to innocence I call postmodern strategic racialization. In other words, the denial that Jews are white, 
In a more nuanced version, it's the denial that Jews have benefited from structural racism or that Jews enjoy white privilege in the United States. I call this move postmodern because it depends crucially on the late 20th century destabilization of the idea of race, itself an important tenet of CRT. It is strategic because it is shifting, contingent, and self-interested. It seeks to evade the current burdens of whiteness without foregoing any of the benefits. Historically, and in the context of critical race theory, the term racialization generally refers to the construction of a particular group, often an ethnic or national group, as non-white, as a prelude to or justification for their subordination or for the denial of some right or opportunity. Differential racialization is a term used by CRT scholars to refer to the dominant white culture characterizing and recharacterizing individuals or groups as white or not white for particular purposes. This may come into play when there is contestation around whether a particular group or individual qualifies as white for some legal or social purpose, such as naturalization, attendance at a white school, or marriage to persons identified as white. Differential racialization reminds us that racialization in American law is not consistent and coherent. Individuals and groups have been variously classified as black or not black, white or not white, or none of these, and the range of available racial categories has varied by time and place. As a move to innocence, the claim that Jews are not white involves Jews racializing themselves to put themselves at a distance from or even outside of whiteness, so that Jews are not implicated in white supremacy, but only victimized by it. But this either or essentialist formulation is simple minded and misses the lessons of differential racialization. The last of the moves to innocence I'll talk about, I call projective prejudice. Ultimately, the accusation that critical race theory is anti Semitic and the utterly careless way in which it is conflated with Black Lives Matter, ethnic studies, DEI initiatives, and any and every form of anti-racism, defines this final move to innocence as both the culmination of all the previous moves and their most aggressive iteration. We are not the racists, they are the racists. As a defense mechanism, projective prejudice combines defensiveness, denial, and oversimplification, while rejecting nuance and contradiction. There is, in the history of Black radical thought in the United States, a genuine strain of anti-Semitism. Regrettably, it has not been disavowed as robustly as might be wished. But this is a far cry from a demonstration that critical race theory is itself anti-Semitic. As I argue above, and as I hope is clear by now, it is relatively easy to demonstrate that it is not. But as with all moves to innocence, the truth or falsehood of the accusation is less relevant than the larger political purpose for which it is offered. Ironically, Jews who feel vaguely insulted by the critical race theory account of white supremacy and CRT's critique of dominant civil rights discourse and ways of thinking are getting something right. Jews have enjoyed access to and success in many of the major institutions of American life from which black people and other people of color have been excluded historically and down to the present day. A critique of structural or systemic racism implies when it does not state explicitly that Jews enjoy race-based advantages, unfair, unearned privilege that does not sit well with many Jews self-conception and receive family stories of immigrant struggle and perseverance. It is not easy or pleasant for many American Jews to integrate into their story of escape from European anti-Semitism, that part of what made the US a reasonably hospitable place for them was that they were not black, a form of prejudice the often penniless Yiddish-speaking Jews of New York City certainly did not create, but from which they did, in fact, benefit. For many Jews of Ashkenazic European descent, myself included, America has largely been the golden land of safety, prosperity, and freedom, of opportunity and belonging. The liberal consensus about race and racism to which critical race theory is a response 
is one in which many Jews have a significant political and cultural investment, one which has, by and large, served Jews well. An attack on the foundations of the legal regime which created this opportunity may have a hard time finding a sympathetic ear. Yet however difficult it may be for many, the time has come to integrate into our understanding an awareness that the American dream for Jews came with a tacit, often unstated condition, that the United States could be all of the things it has been to Jews because we were or were seen as white. Thank you very much for your patience. Thank you so much, Diane. This was so insightful and I could, um, yeah, I have like a million questions already now, but uh, to uh, give the floor to Tiffany, I will just like to suggest that whoever has already some questions, either write them down for yourselves or write them in the chat or just raise a hand and write them down for yourselves and then we'll get to them uh, after Tiffany's uh, comment. But thanks a lot, Tiffany, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um... First, I would like to say to anyone who is celebrating, since we are in the midst of the high holidays, um, I know the, the greetings differ based on the holidays themselves, but I wish you a blessed holiday season. Okay, so um, Diane's paper offers a really wonderful discussion of critical race theory and critiques the idea that critical race theory is anti-Semitic. And as an initial matter, I think it's really important that um, she spends time explaining what critical race theory is and what it is not, especially, especially in light of the intellectually dishonest conversation that is present um, certainly in the United States today. So, you know, op opponents of so-called critical race theory. Um, including the particular individual who really started it, a gentleman named Christopher Rufo. Um, he admitted that he was mischaracterizing his critical race theory at one point. Um, the opponents really fail to understand what it is, that it's an intellectual movement largely rooted in the legal academy um, and um, fueled by the work of activists who were, as Diane was suggesting, um, really engaged in studying the relationships that exist with race, racism, and power. And um, many of these people who object to critical race theory as it has been wrongly described, they view racism as a wholly personal phenomenon. And they see critical race theory as foundationally anti-white. That point, of course, as we have heard already, is untrue. Um, and you know, again, in, in terms of figuring out where they came up with that, what they are really doing is conflating bad diversity training tone deaf appeals to anti-racism that people on the left have often made and discomfort with um, the movement for black lives. They think that all of this is constitutive of critical race theory and it's not, but in any event, um, critical race theory is not foundationally anti-white and those who emphasize racism as being a wholly personal phenomenon are really missing the point of critical race theory because critical race theory does not talk about racism in that way. Um, Diane foregrounds her conversation um, about um, her, her conversation in this paper by um, recognizing that uh, racism that, that, that critical race theory resists the idea of racism as primarily an interpersonal phenomenon and instead views it as rooted in social structures and power hierarchies. So this approach to racism, racism, understanding it as structural and as impersonal rather than individual and infrequent, it's anathema to many of the people who oppose critical race theory. And this conversation is um, demonstrating the ways in which our views of race and racism continue to be deeply contested. So I think that this conversation and in particular, the way that Diane connects it to the conversation about anti-Semitism links very closely to stories of nation, as well as the way that members of groups tell stories of themselves. So thinking about this from the perspective of nation, you might ask yourself, who is America? 
you can compare that to the question, who are the Jews? Who are the Jews in America? What is the story of this particular immigrant descended community in the United States? And what is its relationship to whiteness, to blackness, to freedom, to justice? And in particular, the idea of justice as it is understood by various marginalized groups. If you look at this parallel, from the perspective of the nation writ large talking about the United States, consider the story that we tell about ourselves, that we are a nation that was forged in revolutionary freedom. You can hear the bugles and the popular spirit of a democratic republic. And even though we committed the original sin of trafficking in human flesh, we corrected this error by renewing our faith in freedom and equality. All of that sounds very lovely, um, <clears throat> excuse me. And in particular, because of our willingness to evolve and the progress that we have made, you know, this version of America sees itself as that city on the hill, which is exceptional in nature and frankly deserving of all of the good things that have happened to us. Now, obviously this story is contested by many who would complicate that narrative, but it is our story. Diane parallels this story in her commentary on innocence and the way it impacts the manner in which various members of the Jewish community may perceive themselves. Um, she roots this in what she described as a quote, strategy of positioning where quote, the descendants of Jewish immigrants herself included are relieved of feelings of guilt or responsibility for structures of white privilege and black subordination from which she she and other Jews have benefited and continue to benefit without giving up power or privilege, without having to change much at all. Now, of course, um, there, you know, the, as, as a small aside, and it's something that Diane certainly addresses, um, it is worth noting that this analysis translates only for white Jews to the degree, of course, that one might accept Jews as white. Um, <laughs> Excuse me, you know, and I point this out because obviously Jews of other racial groups, especially Black Jews or other Jews of color in the United States, experience the dual challenges of racism and anti Semitism, and by definition, do not participate in the move to innocence that, 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 that Diane has described because they literally and logically cannot. So you know, you know, acknowledging that, but also recognizing that the number of people to whom that applies is really quite small. Um, so, you know, I just put that out there because I think it's still important to, to, to note it. Um, I also think it's interesting to observe in the context of this uh, discussion um, about anti-Semitism and critical race theory, um, I, I think it's important to point this out um, because one of the insights that I have always found especially valuable in critical race theory is the way that conversations about race in the United States fall into the black white binary, um, substantially excluding conversations about other groups and assuming that resolution of the problems that exist between blacks and whites can simply be transferred to other groups and that will resolve their difficulties, their challenges as well. I don't understand Diane to be saying that in her paper. She is not saying that in her paper. Nonetheless, there is a recognition that this conversation is very much a conversation about the relationship between blacks and whites. And to the degree that other groups are relevant, I don't know that it has a huge impact on the overall um, uh, on, 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 on the overall issues that are at stake here. But nonetheless, I do think that it's um, it's 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 just reflective of a problem that I see sometimes in conversations that we have in the United States about race, where we focus so much on black people to the exclusion blacks and whites, I should say, to the exclusion of other dynamics. In any event. Thinking about her specific claims, the move to innocence and the um, impact that this has on her argument about um, the lack of anti-Semitism that is within critical race theory, I think a few of the points that she made really stand out. One, 
focusing on the individual lack of historic responsibility, the point that my family was not even here and focus and, and, and ignoring, um, you know, quiet complicity in the way that structures were developed and the way in which people participated in them. Um, also the point about shared experiences of discrimination without acknowledging the differences in those experiences and the degree to which power dynamics have implicated some members of the Jewish community in the creation of the barriers that have, um, that have undermined um, black access in particular access that others may have experienced as well. Um, and when I talk about access, of course, I'm talking about access to full equality within society. And I also really appreciated the conversation about the role of allyship between Blacks and Jews, especially during the civil rights movement. Um, I think that all of this has to do with history and the stories that we tell about ourselves. And the efforts to disconnect historical experiences from current experiences of bias, um, you know, especially bias that is rooted in the way that flawed institutions work, that's really a very deeply American story. It reflects the story of America and race, especially when told with an eye toward Black people. Diane is very much telling a story about assimilation and the way that groups assimilate into the larger mythos of American innocence. Perhaps the in innocence was not initially held, but it has arguably been reclaimed. At least that is the assertion that many white people in the United States would make now. Now, you might critique my suggestion here by noting that it conflates whiteness with Americanness. It conflates whiteness with citizenship. It conflates whiteness with political belonging. And as an American who is proud to be an American, that would seem to undercut my own view as you know, a member of my own, my own political community. But that's not really what I'm doing. That's not quite right. I'm just reflecting on the way that whiteness has historically been conflated with all of these ideas, requiring the exclusion of non-whites from the broader conception of the American political community. And so the move to innocence that Diane describes in her paper is not just an argument about Jewish blamelessness for structural racism. racism racism. It is also a point of commonality with a constructed white community writ large, much of which has frankly grown tired of the conversation about race and racism, racism, and very robustly asserts their own lack of individual fault, as well as the fallacy of believing in structural racism at all. So this is an argument um, about racism, about, about innocence and racism, 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 sorry, I can't talk this morning, on its own. And it allows Jews who critique critical race theory as anti-Semitic because of its insistence that Jews of European descent are white in the way that we are discussing, it allows them to actually align with the larger community of American whites, which is why I describe it as assimilationist in nature. I mean, ultimately, the you know these comments really explain why I view Diane's paper as part of a larger conversation about the stories that all of us tell about ourselves as ethnic, civic, and political actors, and link to that the way that sophisticated constructions of memory are produced. We select, analyze, and interpret our own histories with an eye toward a larger goal, whatever that goal might be. And one of the most common forms of constructed memory in the American context is the one that acknowledges the past of racial subordination while disconnecting white people in the present from any linkage to that past. In fact, we often see an inversion of this story when some people argue that the folks who are actually responsible for contemporary racism are people of color, especially to the degree that we continue to focus on race. Now, this is not 
in its particulars reflective of the critical race theory critique that Diane has pointed out, specifically the idea that critical race theory might be anti-Semitic because it views Jews as white and fails to account sufficiently well for the way that anti-Semitism contributes to, marginaliz to marginalization, but still the common point is the claim of innocence and the effort to excise the history of widespread participation in forms of discrimination, whether it was intended or not. So thank you.